Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the 32nd meeting in 2014 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. Can I please remind everyone present to please turn off any mobile phones or other electronic devices. And can I welcome to the meeting and to the committee our new member Mark Back to the Future Macdonald who returns to the committee uh, replacing Jamie Hepburn. I'd like to invite Mark to declare any interest relevant to the remit of the committee. Uh, not sure if that makes you Doc Brown, convener, but I have no interests to declare. Uh, thank you for that, Mark. Uh, we move on swiftly to Agenda Item 1. And our first item of business this morning is to decide whether to consider Agenda Item 3 in private. Are members agreed? Yes. Members have indicated their agreement. Uh, and Agenda Item 2, uh, our next item of business is to take advice evidence, I should say, on further fiscal devolution from uh, Elspeth Orcherton uh, from the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Scotland, uh, Isabel Dinverno from the Law Society of Scotland, uh, Alexander Garden uh, uh, from the Chartered Institute of Taxation Scotland Hub. Uh, and members have received papers from each of our witnesses, so we're going to go straight to questions. And as always, uh, questions will begin with myself before opening out to uh, other uh, colleagues around the table. And uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank our contributors for the, the excellent and substantive nature of uh, their submissions. I actually have to say that um, there's plenty of meat in there for us to uh, get tore into, so to speak. So um, where shall we start? That's always a question. Well, let's, um, let's look at the... Uh, as soon as they're in order, I'll, I'll do it that way, may as well. Eh? Uh, the Chartered Institute of Taxation, actually, and uh, I'm quite pleased that you've annotated things numerically so members can look quite clearly at areas where I'm asking a question on. And the first question I'll just ask uh, is with regard to um, paragraph uh, 3.6. Um, with regard to VAT, you're suggesting that uh, you would not recommend assignment of revenues be considered until it's clear that it's possible uh, to measure to an acceptable standard of accuracy the revenue attributable to Scotland. We do not believe it's currently possible to achieve this for VAT or corporation tax. Well, of course, you'll know from Smith that uh, while corporation tax is not being recommended uh, um, for uh, devolution, assignment of VAT actually is. So, obviously, I have some concerns. I'm sure I remember do too about um, your suggestion that um, it's not possible to measure to an acceptable standard of accuracy. So, I'm just wondering if you can tell us what that standard uh, would be and how it could be obtained. I mean, the Smith Commission does highlight the fact that the receipts will be calculated on a verified basis to be agreed between the UK and the Scottish Government. So I think that highlights that, that there's an acceptance there that, the, uh, that there needs to be some kind of, of basis, and that is, is yet to be uh, agreed. And I think that the difficulty with, with VAT is there are a number of ways of looking at it. You have the, the VAT amount itself, you have the, the net position when you go all the way through the, the, the chain, you have the question of whether place, place of supply uh, is relevant, uh, and you have the, uh, I, I think, various other ways that, that one could look at it. So I, I don't think I can give an easy answer to your question. I think what we were trying to do in our paper was highlight um, that, uh, that there are a number of ways that, that one could skin this cat, uh, and I think it's been highlighted in, in Smith that uh, that there needs to be an agreed way of, of doing it, and uh, it is yet to be seen what that might be. Okay. Uh, do, do, um, Elspeth, have you got any comments you want to make on that, particularly um, in terms of VAT? The, the only statistical split I've found so far to try and address this issue is a paper by HMRC, a methodology note they produced in October, I don't know if the committee's seen that, where they start to address the issue of disaggregation of, of receipts. Their approach is to look at VAT actually from the consumption end. Uh, the way VAT works is everyone who adds value in a supply chain has a net addition. Ultimately, it's borne by a consumer, basically the public. Um, <clears throat> uh, some also buy partially exempt or exempt businesses, but broadly by the public. Um, whether that gives you um, a measure of the consumption by Scottish taxpayers and in Scotland, which I think it would give you, whether that is the, the allocation you're actually um, intellectually trying to get to 
if it was to be an allocation that you thought was more about the productive capacity of the economy. It's not doing that. It's looking at the consumption end. Um, I think it's really difficult to know from the nature of the tax where actually the, the receipts are, uh, or which economy, if you think about it, is Scotland or the rest of the UK, the tax generated is attributable to. Um, and I'm not aware of any other methodology that actually tries to do that. So it's probably a matter of deciding intellectually what you want to do or conceptually, and then looking at what sources of data might be available or what extrapolations or uh, interpretations and analysis could be, could be applied to that. So it's probably going back to the principles. Okay. Could, and, could, I, could I just add Yeah, I'm just about to. to I was going to ask you something <laughs> specifically on this, but... Um, no, it was it was just sort of following on from from what Elspeth was was saying. There's there's probably completely different approaches. I mean, you could, for example, say that traders had to indicate how many of their supplies were made in Scotland as compared to England. So, you could say to W H Smiths, tell us what the supplies are from all your Scottish stores, and that would give you a split for them. But I mean, every trader would would have to do that, and that's looking at it from the supply side. But because VAT is, has this sort of supplies and reclaiming um, VAT on inputs, there is the completely different approach that Elspeth outlined of looking at it on a consumption basis. But I think the issue with looking at it on a consumption basis is how on earth would you verify that? Okay, thank you. The, the area I was going to ask uh, um, yourself on, um, Isabel, was... Um, about uh, policy matters. I mean, does the Law Society of Scotland have a view as to if um, whether or not the Scottish Parliament should have any say in terms of the setting of VAT policy at UK level if they uh, to receive assign assigned revenues? Um, I, I think probably the, the, the nature of um, dealing with shifts of revenue by assigning the, the revenues is generally that it, it isn't accompanied by a say in policy um, and it, it, it's only where the uh, setting of, of uh, rates or indeed dealing with the tax itself um, is devolved that you would expect that to be accompanied by a change in, in policy. I think the Law Society is probably reluctant to be saying whether things should or should not be devolved but rather just pointing out the, the issues with with, with devolution. I notice the Law Society hedged its bets a lot more uh, than uh, <laughs> your colleagues uh, on the panel there, I have to say. Um, but, but, um, back to yourself, Alexander, in terms of uh, paragraph 4.2, you've uh, had quite an interesting uh, comment here. You've said that some bodies receiving funding from central government by way of refunds of tax outside the strict operation of VAT so receive outside the strict operation of the VAT system. It may be worth considering the extent to which similar powers could be devolved rather than devolved powers over changing aspects of the tax system. I'm quite intrigued by that. I'm just wondering if you can tell us a wee bit more about your thinking on that. Uh, I'm going to have to hold my hand up here. I was uh, thrown in at the, the last minute to stand in for the chair of our technical committee and I picked up on this point as well and I hadn't been involved, or involved in this section so I can't give specific examples of what uh, similar powers... Uh, are, are being uh, re referred to here, but it's, it's, it's something I tried to get an answer to and failed in time for this, this meeting and something I can, I can feed back. Just if you could maybe provide some follow-up on that, because it is an area of some interest. OK, we'll move on to yourself, Elspeth, in terms of your own submission, and uh, very early on in your submission, in the part of the section, Economic Growth and, and Job Creation, you, you, the, you suggest that um, uh, power could be devolved to allow the setting of a minimum wage for Scotland. Of course, that's not been recommended by Smith, but I'm just wondering if you can tell us what you're thinking is specifically on that uh, particular issue. It's quite difficult to identify, um, I suppose, the more generic uh, powers uh, that assist economic growth and job creation. Uh, if you're looking at job creation, other than things that um, affect the employment market uh, uh, in, in itself, it did seem to us that if you were to take something like the minimum wage, uh, it should be relatively straightforward to identify who was employed in Scotland, um, barring the usual boundary issues, and, and uh, separate that out. Uh, and, and that was a feeling that came from some of our committees that 
if particularly those who felt very strongly on the social justice uh, argument, um, that that was something that could perhaps be separable. Uh, it's not a tax power, although it is administered by, at the moment, each MRC. Um. Uh, and, and um, um, Alexander, you set out your general principles at the very start of your paper, talking about certainty, proportion, uh, proportionability, pay, convenience, efficiency, etc., and you go on to talk about simplicity, stability, fairness, and consultation. What's your view, therefore, on, on that same issue? A minimum wage? Um, Is it something you feel as an organisation should be devolved? I, I don't think it's something we'd particularly uh, considered um, as, as part of our uh, re review of this in terms of the, the minimum wage position. Um, so I don't, I don't think I actually do have anything, anything else to add on that. Okay. Uh, Isabel, do you get anything to add on that um, issue? Again, I d it's, it's not something that uh, we had considered, but I think generally if we had considered it, we would have... Um, form the same view as ICAST did, that it is something that would make sense and could could be devolved. And um, there, is a, there, there is the whole um, issue of different prices and different costs in Scotland and all the rest of it. So it does make sense for it to be to be devolved. OK. Now, Isabel, in, in your paper, and indeed in Alexander's particular, you talked about this uh, annual tax on enveloped dwellings, which, of course, uh, is something we talk about all the time here on the, <laughs> in the Finance Committee. And uh, in paragraph 17 of your submission, you know, you uh, say in the very last sentence, we recommend that amendments should be made to the ATED legislation so that it does not apply to properties in Scotland. I wonder if you can give us some a bit more specifics on that. I'm very there. glad you've raised this point because it's something that we do feel very strongly about, even though the ATED is, is, is perhaps something that we don't come across every day. Um, we, we think that it is um, an example of tax being devolved to Scotland and then the consequences of that not being followed through at Westminster. So um, SDLT was devolved to Scotland or is being devolved to Scotland from next year. It's being replaced by the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax. ATED is very similar to SDLT. It's kind of an, an add-on to SDLT but it's not the same tax, so it's not switched off by the Scotland Act and continues to apply to properties in Scotland. Why is this not appropriate? Well, it's because the Scottish Government has its own view about how to deal with um, LBTT avoidance. Well, we're probably not going to have any because it has a very fierce approach to it, but um, it has uh, the, its own policy objectives. And the way the Scottish Government has decided to look at enveloping properties, that is, buying properties through companies, is to have a possible charge on the transfer of shares in those companies. So you would have LBTT on the transfer of the shares. ATED is an annual charge that companies have to pay, or other non-natural persons, if they, if, where they own residential property. So it's just like having a Westminster tax on something at the same time as a Scottish tax. So really, ATED should have been switched off for Scottish properties. Um, the, the rates of ATED used to be quite high, so uh, it was £2 million, and there aren't a huge number of £2 million properties in Scotland, as we know. However, the rates are now coming down, so it is more of, a, more of an issue. But in reality, regardless of what the rates are, you should not have a situation where a tax is devolved to Scotland and then a sort of tax that's pretty much an add-on to it still remains at Westminster. It's a, it's a kind of conflict that, that we shouldn't really have. I mean, Alexander, your paper at paragraph 8.5, you seem to take a slightly different view and you say that uh, it seems logically eight edge should also be devolved uh, with the Scottish Government able to choose whether or not to operate a similar tax or apply alternative or existing measures, but then you also say that it would be possible to retain ATED as a UK-wide tax, but require HMRC to pay the tax in respect of Scottish properties. Um, I think it's just an example of there's, there's a number of ways one can look at it. I'd, I'd endorse what Isabel said, that right. the, the starting point is if, if you have a particular tax devolved, mm -hmm. it is important to look at, at uh, other similar taxes that, that may be covered elsewhere, and uh, Isabel makes a good point about the specific provisions under LPTT uh, to deal with, with corporate structures. 
I think what we were trying to do here was just to say that if, if, if there is a policy decision to do something different, then that there are other ways that one could look at it to try and, uh, within the, uh, the overall structure, uh, try and pass on some of the, 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 the fiscal uh, benefit through the, uh, through the al allocation point. But I, I think equally, um, it, it's pro probably now that the rates for ATED are coming down, as Isabel said, uh, and is potentially more, more relevant in, in, in Scotland, uh, I think, uh, given that there is a provision under the LBTT Act that, uh, that could, could be utilised, that, that the switching it off is, is one that perhaps is, uh, is the most obvious, uh, obvious route to follow. Yes, it's obviously ultimately going to affect houses over half a million pounds. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just wondering, I mean, this is the first time I've really come across this, and it's been in two of your three submissions. I'm just wondering why, um, Elspeth, why, for example, it wasn't in you know, the ICAST submission in, in terms of the land buildings transaction tax? Um, I think at that stage it was, it, or it is just such a new tax, and it was is not really considered to be widely applicable in Scotland. I was just flicking through the the same tax estimate paper and the estimate of the, the amount of tax payable in Scotland for the current or for the year just finished is is a million pounds um, now that's probably half just about half of that is rounding so it's not the biggest issue for taxpayers in Scotland at the moment um, having heard the discussions and the points I think our view would be we would agree you should keep it all together with LBTT so I would be happy to agree with the with, with the law society's view on that yes yeah, sorry Gavin wants to come in with supplementary on this no, I, mean, I think you, you raise a, a very interesting point Kevin. I just wonder to 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 uh, um, groups that have raised it before I mean have you have you raised this with the um, authorities as it were or is it is it and, and what kind of response have you had it'd be quite interesting to to know We've certainly raised it with HMRC on a number of occasions, and the response um, hitherto has been uh, we have no plans to devolve any further taxes to Scotland and so on. Um, and uh, the, also the fact that, well, it probably doesn't apply to a huge number of properties in Scotland. But with the rates coming down, I think there is an acceptance by HMRC, certainly, that um, it, it, it's, it's not really appropriate. I and mean, I think if... ATED had been around when the d initial discussions on devolving LB SDLT to Scotland had been taking place. No one would have suggested devolving SDLT and not ATED. It's the fact that it came along afterwards that's, that's really caused the problem. But I think, I think there's an important general point that we need to make sure that this devolution of taxes is to some extent future-proofed so that we don't have, for example, a devolution of income tax rates as were proposed under Smith but then have a Westminster different tax on, you know, a super profits tax, for example, which wouldn't be caught by the, the rates being devolved to Scotland. I don't imagine for a moment that that might happen, but it is, you know, it's, it's an example of that sort of thing. It's very hard to predict what taxes will be introduced in the future, but there needs to be a sort of fair play clause or something like that. You were wanting to come in with a point on the seated as yeah. so. well. A point I indicated that was leading in that general direction. I mean, obviously, the point that you raise goes wider than simply the tax powers, and there are a number of powers which are proposed to be devolved. Some could be devolved earlier, and we'll maybe touch on that a little bit later. But the general trend is that there will be a, a, a lag in terms of uh, legislation going through, etc. So y you would suggest that there needs to be some sort of sort of articles of good faith, if you will, that, the, that during that process, new systems or n new policy decisions will not come in, which would um, either undermine that transfer or create um, a, a, a power that applies on a UK basis, but which would not transfer when those powers are devolved. Yes, or that what was being devolved could be adjusted to take into account, you know, the, in, the, the changes in the interim, something along those lines. Okay. Well, I was just going to ask one further question and then open it out to colleagues around the table, but none have made any bids to ask any questions, so I shall continue until they do. Oh, suddenly they've all woken up and the hands are all going up. Good, I thought that would get them going. Right, OK, the... the Further, the last question I'm going to ask before opening it up, as I said, is uh, to, your, to yourself, actually, Elspeth, and it's re regarding your paper, 
paragraph uh, 7.18. Um, um, we're talking about demographics in this uh, excellent section. You've said that uh, other factors could influence assumptions made about Scotland's demographics in the decades to come. Policies which successfully increase the proportion of the population are expected to be economically active or improve the predicted life expectancy and health life expectancy could in time change the analysis. And I'm just wondering if there's any powers you feel are being recommended by the Smith Commission that will allow Scotland to uh, achieve this. I'm not sure that the powers in the Smith Commission are necessarily intended to achieve this. Um, when we're looking at, you know, what, we, what would increase the proportion of the population are economically active, uh, it's probably looking at, well, it could be pension age. I, I take that back. Could could be pension age. Um, but it's probably more how many people wish to work. Um, it could be uh, about uh, getting the 18 to 24 year olds into employment at an, at an earlier stage. So a lot of that sits under economic development, which has already devolved. Uh, in terms of life expectancy and healthy outcomes, a lot of that probably sits within the health regime anyway, in particular prevent preventative health, which has devolved anyway. So I'm not sure that these were issues or intended to be issues that Smith should be aiming at, but was an observation that statistics and forecasts over time change depending on what's actually happening in the underlying population and how they might be responding to initiatives on smoking or drinking or whatever, whatever it might be that are already in the sites, well in the sites of the Parliament. But immigration is obviously something which would impact on the, uh, you know, uh, demographics. That mm -hmm. and the birth rate, really, of the, of the two. Uh, and uh, uh, that's not something, immigration is not something that's being devolved by Smith, is it? So, I mean, surely without that control, it's very difficult to achieve any other. It was put to me yesterday that immigration isn't as much of an issue in Scotland as emigration of talent. Um, now, I have no statistics on that, but um, I think there's probably the two, two aspects. Um, it goes beyond population and immigration, immigration statistics go beyond my, my area of expertise. But I think the, the general attractiveness of, say, the jobs market, of the types of businesses that are attracted to being in Scotland, um, that, that whole piece is what will keep talented young people, talented middle-aged or older people for that matter, um, staying and working in, in, in Scotland? I mean, ultimately, it's about economics. I mean, if, I mean Scotland's been losing 30,000 to 40,000 people in the 20 to 30 age group for, for each year in the last decade. So, I mean, that's clearly uh, has a major impact on the demographics for the future. And, yeah, um, oh, sorry, presumably the, the power to set income tax rates could be used to, you know, try and uh, persuade people to remain in Scotland. I don't know whether the Smith proposals would allow, for example, different rates of tax to be payable by younger people compared to older people. I don't know if that's even possible, but um, but there's also quite a wide flexibility, one would have thought, in, in setting uh, the rates and having very low rates at, at, at lower levels, e even though there isn't a... Um, the, the personal allowance isn't to be devolved it, you know, perhaps a very low rate on the first chunk of above the personal allowance has pretty much the same effect. So you, know, you would think that, that, that the, the income tax powers could be used imaginatively to try and reverse the, the, the brain drain. Mm. <laughs> um, Alexander, something you want to comment on there? Uh, no, no. I just to pick up again on on the point that, that Isabel makes that that's that's the one the one that is there and that there is flexibility and I think it, it can be looked at in a, in a number of different ways and I don't have specific specific statistics, uh, but Professor John Kay has put various figures out there about how much tax is is taken in in terms of income tax at the at the different levels. So I think that uh, suggests that the, the the ability to have some imaginative use of uh, flexible rates and bands starting starting right at the, at the bottom is, is something that could be utilised and could impact on encouraging talent. Okay. Not convinced that there's as much flexibility as, as being suggested, but 
Anyway, um, we might come back to some of these things. I'll certainly uh, got a few things I would like to ask, but colleagues may pick it up as we pick these up as we uh, go along. So now we have a plethora of members who are keen to ask questions. The first one will be Mark, followed by the Deputy Convener. So, Mark. Th thank you very much, Convener, and thank you for coming along this morning, and thank you also for your, your written evidence, which, as the Convener said, was, was a, a, a meaty read. Um, and there are a number of issues within it that I wanted to, to pull out. Um, in, in terms of the Chartered Institute of Taxation, um, at paragraph 5.5, .5 you say, in respect of the block grant, uh, it is important that the formula for reduction is transparent. Um, additionally, there must be coordination between the UK uh, and Scottish governments in relation to taxes. So the first point would be, um, in terms of the, the transparency of the Barnett formula, do you think that there is a, a lack of transparency at present as to how the calculations operate within that? I think there's certainly a lack of understanding and I think going forward with more variables in there, I think the point we were making is that as, as that the, the flexibility in, increases going forward, the transparency point is, is a very important one. And, and do you perceive there being implications if that transparency is not dealt with given the, the, the devolution of tax powers that will be coming to Scotland? I, th I think if it, if, it if it impacts, I think it, it, it comes back to what, what is trying to be, be achieved and, and what, what all the knock-on effects are, I think, to, to make, it, make it work and to, to, to see what happens with what is devolved at an early stage, uh, seeing how, how that impacts on everything uh, is, is important going forward. I mean, obviously, and, and happy to take, take a view from, from the other panel members on this, uh, the, the, as you mentioned, your stamp duty has been devolved and is to become land and buildings transaction tax and at present there has still not been a resolution in terms of the impact on the block grant uh, as a result of that the Scottish Government still doesn't know if the, the way that they are structuring the tax will prove to be revenue neutral because the Treasury have not given those figures over and we're obviously fast approaching the, the budget setting. Um, does that give cause for concern that that process for uh, the stamp duty devolution um, could be repeated in future for income tax, for example, and the, the difficulties that that might give a rise to? Um, I, I, I think it's, it's important that it, that it is resolved and that there is clarity going, going forward. And I'm assuming that coming out of, of this process that, that that will happen and it will become easier going, going forward looking at, looking at other taxes. I don't know if colleagues have... I think, I think to answer your first point, um, I have yet to meet anyone on the planet who could explain the Barnett formula to me, but maybe I should get out more or something. Um, I don't think it's well understood. Um, I don't think it's appreciated necessarily what it was intended to do, why it might work, why it might not work. Um, so, so there's almost the groundwork and the homework to be done, I think, before a lot of the debate happens. I think it is really important that um, agreements are reached and I think are explained as to why the adjustments are the way they are and how, how, how the funding works because if we're not going to have the full accountability of the, of, of the independence, um, then I, I think it has become much more important to, uh, to our members, to voters and, and those in Scotland that they understand what, what, what the settlement is. I think on the, the other hand, there's a whole load of administrative provisions that actually sit around that um, as to how the tax authorities operate and how the parliaments work together. Uh, and certainly in our submission at another point, we'd said we thought with that need to reach agreement on block grant, never mind the wider powers and making things coherent um, between the parliaments, that there might need to be different processes and mechanisms. So, so very, very important, though that uh, a clear agreement is reached as soon as possible? I, I think, or, or we, we think, that there ought to be more of, a, of an agreed timetable for reaching agreement on the adjustments to the block grant, for ex because it's not really fair for a devolved administration to have to set tax rates before they know what the block grant adjustment is. It's, it, it's a, that's back to front. How can you possibly figure out what will be revenue neutral if you don't know the basis of the, of, the, of the adjustment. I mean, obviously, this is all new territory, so it's not something that's been done before, but it seemed, there seems an awful lot of brinkmanship and, 
you know, the, 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 the LBTT draft rates have now been announced, but it's ridiculous to be trying to do that whilst not knowing what the basis of adjustment to the, to the block grant is. So I wonder if it's possible to have more of a, you know, it ha the, the, these adjustments have to be agreed between the parliaments a certain time before the new tax comes into effect and in any event before the rates are introduced or something like that. Um, having said that, th these things are never simple and the way that's, that makes the most sense to adjust it for LBTT might not make the most sense for income tax. But I think it's, it's the timetable that's not really right at the moment to, to be not knowing how it's going to be done yet when, when this committee has to consider the, the rates of LBTT. Um, t turning to the, the annex of the, of the uh, Chart Institute Taxation submission at PARA 5.3, you talk about the complexities that would arise were there to be devolution of corporation tax. Obviously, since this submission, I suspect, was, was being put together, there has been the um, indication from the UK government that corporation tax is to be devolved but to Northern Ireland. Do you see this being the same scenario in that regard or do you think that the scenario you've outlined here is uh, overcomable? I believe the scenario that we've out outlined is, is realistic as to what the implications would, uh, would be. Uh, Northern Ireland, I think, has certain uh, particular um, circumstances, obviously, but looking, looking purely at the Scotland and the rest of the UK point, uh, if, if, if we look elsewhere, as soon as uh, businesses start operating in different jurisdictions, there are uh, most definitely complexities added. And I think it's very important to recognise the number of businesses that operate in Scotland and the rest of the UK. And I think very importantly, uh, the majority of those are not multinationals that are operating in multiple jurisdictions, but a lot of them fall into the very important sector in Scotland of, of SMEs and so on. So I think the point that we were, we're trying to, to make here is, is, is the importance of, of un understanding what the implications uh, of, of looking at a particular tax, like corporation tax, uh, would, would be uh, in terms of the complexities in terms of both administration from the tax authority's perspective and also uh, the uh, businesses themselves having to, to operate with, uh, with that extra layer. Turning to the, the ICAS um, submission and um, I think part of 5.44, I think probably best summarised as the, the law of unintended consequences around the impact of tax changes on benefit recipients. And um, I also sit on the Devolution Further Powers Committee and we were having a discussion last week around some of the impacts around perhaps topping up of benefits or creation of new benefits might have in a similar context. What, what solution do you see? Uh, I, know, I know you talk about workable solutions. What kind of workable solutions would you be looking at in terms of ensuring that um, there was the flexibility to make changes without it essentially resulting in individuals being penalised through powers that exist elsewhere? I think the um, solutions we're looking at, and it, it, it echoes what Isabel was saying earlier, is an understanding of where the consequences will pop out or where the interactions might arise and planning for them accordingly so that if there is to be um, a welfare power, for example, devolved, that it is understood what the impact is on the recipient and, and almost that it's ring-fenced from uh, the other parliament system and, and, and vice versa. So I think anything can be catered for but you actually have to spend the time actually going into the detail, looking at a lot of different scenarios and circumstances of possible claimants in, in, in this case, uh, looking at the interaction of the powers and, and scoping out, or in, as the case may be, the impact you want on the individual from the other, the other legislation. So it's, it's, it's workable in the sense that it's about good implementation of policy, but it requires agreement between the parliaments to make sure that the, the, the consequences sought from both sides are, are those that are actually achieved. Um, also, um, within the um, 
ICAS um, submission, you talk about borrowing powers being used or being uh, the, the allowance being given for borrowing powers to fund preventative spend. It's at Part 9.3. Uh, could you do, do you think the framework set out in the Smith Commission? I think it's Part nine. I think it's point ninety five five, which which deals with this. Do you think that the the powers that are envisaged within the Smith Commission would allow for that, or do you think there would need to be some further work done to enable that to happen? Um, without being an expert on, on, on the borrowing powers, tax, tax is more my area. They did seem to be in the right direction. Um, it, it, it's difficult to see because I think it's probably at the, the extent it would need to have some numbers put on it. Um, but it is certainly something that I know a lot of our members have, have, have raised in discussions that, that further borrowing powers were required. Um, I'm not sure of anything m more to add to that in terms of the specific shaping uh, of the policy. I think it, w it would be quite interesting to maybe see some of the thinking that, that, that lies behind that, but, but perhaps that's something we could come back to. Do, yeah. yes. um, final question, if I may convene, returning to the, the Law Society submission, at Para 14, um, the discussion of air passenger duty. Uh, and um, we do not anticipate that devolving APD would result in technical difficulties or significant administrative or economic inefficiencies. We've seen a call from the three major airports in Scotland for there to be a transfer of APD as soon as possible. Um, the Secretary of State said last week at the Devolution Further Powers Committee that this is a tax that could be devolved early. Um, is there a view from the panel, not just on APD, but on other powers that are contained within the Smith proposals around the possibility of disaggregating some of those and transferring early rather than transferring everything in one package? I, th I think our uh, feeling on air passenger duty was that it, it could be dealt with more quickly um, than, than perhaps income tax rates. Um, where obviously there is al already legislation in place to deal with the Scottish rate of income tax, which one would imagine the Smith proposals would, would build on. But air passenger duty, the, there's, there's, um, is, it's a much probably simpler thing and could be devolved um, more readily. And there's also a, a great deal of enthusiasm for it to be devolved, as you've explained. So I, d I don't see why it should all have to be necessarily done together. Okay. I think the, um, there are two things to think about. One is devolving the power over the tax. Uh, and the second, and it can be separate, is deciding how the tax should be administered. Um, if you were assuming you wanted to give Revenue Scotland the administrative power over air passenger duty, it may take longer to transfer that out of HMRC to Revenue Scotland, simply because they don't have the, the, the whole mechanism in place yet to, to operate it, then it would to um, set the power, which could be done at a parliament level, and let HMRC administer and, and transfer over in due course if, if that was what was decided. So I think with some of these, with that, you could probably separate the administrative arrangements from the power over it or, or operate it on a transitional basis. So I think that's a possibility to think about. Um, whether, if you wish to move all together, I mean, it took th what, three years to set up land and buildings transaction tax to be <coughs> operational between passing legislation and it, it actually starting, as we expect, in April next year. If you didn't want the same delay in air passenger duty, and it may be a bit smaller, uh, a bit shorter than that, then, then that would be an option to consider again. Um, but that, that's not for, for, for us to see how you, should, how you should do that, but it would be an option if you wished to have a staged implementation or as early implementation as you could have of the individual powers rather than wait till the last one was ready and then switch everything on at the same date, because that could be some way, way down the line. I, th I think on, on APD our thinking was that the legislation would be considerably simpler than the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax. I mean, I can't say I'm familiar with it, but I, do, I don't think it's very complicated. So on that basis, to produce a, an APD or a Scottish APD or whatever it would be bill wouldn't, wouldn't take nearly as long as the LBTT process. But obviously, as Eleanor says, 
as, El as, El as Elspeth says, devolving it, uh, getting Revenue Scotland geared up to actually administer that, um, you know, that, that would need to be factored in. Yeah, our, our view, I think we commented on it being relatively easy to devolve, and again, it was the point about the, the, uh, the legislation to, uh, around it rather than the administration. I don't know enough about the administration as to how difficult it would be for Revenue Scotland to, to take that on, but I, I agree wholeheartedly that uh, sufficient time would need to, uh, to, to be allowed to ensure that it was effective administration from, from day one once it was taken on. Mark, uh, John to be followed by Jean. Hey, thanks, convener. Um, I, I should probably say I'm a member of ICAST, so that uh, will therefore make me probably more aggressive in my questioning <laughs> towards the uh, institute. Uh, however, if we start on the others, um, I mean, I'm fascinated by this VAT question that came up already, the convener asked, and uh, I mean, I, I suspect we're going to spend quite a lot more time on that because it does open up a lot of thoughts in my mind. I mean, if it's based on consumption and if let, can I take an example uh, like I think biscuits have VAT on them I believe and uh, the, I have a biscuit plant in my constituency so if they make loads and loads of biscuits but they're mainly sold in England we would not get any of the VAT on that whatsoever if it's only based on consumption because it's where the people that would buy despite the fact we actually added value in Glasgow and, and the point of VAT is that you tax every time you add value. So, so there's two kind of, do, do, if you just look at the consumption, you're going to miss all that kind of manufacturing side. Uh, but would it be horrendously complicated to um, take every step and allocate it? Therefore, if it hap because if it happened in Scotland and they made the biscuits, then we'd just take all of that, would we? I mean, your, your first example of the consumption against the production is, is uh, absolutely right. And that's why when I looked at the statistics that were being produced in, in the current HMRC analysis, and that's, that's a process they are going through to work out what should be done, um, I raised an eyebrow because I wasn't convinced that was what was necessarily what was expected, uh, which was probably much more about the productivity of 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 the um, economy. In terms of how you would do it, um, I think it would start to get quite difficult because if you imagine your biscuit factory selling, um, say, to a supermarket in England or, or in, to, to individuals in England, um, you could look at its VAT return, but it would have the sales value and the output, but it would have uh, be able to deduct all its input. So you'd to work out what was produced in Scotland, you'd have to go to probably an economic value-added type measure, which doesn't necessarily come easily from the VAT returns. Uh, in terms of splitting the geography, you'd have, to, you'd have to have quite a few extra steps in a VAT return to identify where your inputs were coming from. Or could you not just take for that factory, you just take whatever the net VAT was, because it's in Scotland, you would just take it for Scotland? I, I, th I think it might get more complicated. I haven't thought this one through with, would you have to consider where it was getting its inputs from? There may be a methodology in there that would mm. actually work. If we assumed we could work on the, the outputs, you're then looking at having to have that returns on a production unit rather than a corporate entity or group basis, which you have at the moment. Um, so if you had a business operating across the UK on one VAT return, it might have four factories, but one VAT return, you then have to start doing splits from, from, from that in terms of the, 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 the mm -hmm. productivity. So whether there are other economic indicators that would, would serve as useful proxies, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. You, you've yes, also something. got to, to avoid double counting because you know, your biscuit factory sells it to the supermarket in Scotland and the supermarket sells... So, you know, you, you don't want the... How would you make sure you weren't getting the same VAT receipts? Twice? Well, I mean, this particular biscuit factory sends all its products to England and oh. then they are driven back up to Scotland to the supermarket. So there's kind of odd <laughs> things go on. I mean, Mr Garden, you, you raised this, uh, this whole area yourself. I mean, if we don't get the VAT on production, then it wouldn't matter whether a factory was in Scotland or England because if we're only looking at where the consumer gets it. And so that, that would seem odd if we were, had all these factories in Scotland and get none of the VAT out of them. 
Yeah, I think depending which way you you look at it, it it I, th I think you need you need to look at it across the board. I think, but I think the point is how how do we how how, how easy is it to find a, a way of trace, tracing it through? And, and all, all we see is this comment that the receipts raised in Scotland and Smith. So I think we we, we could probably spend <laughs> spend a lot of time trying to work it that work one it. again yeah. sometime. Okay, thanks so much. Um, the Law Society, uh, one of the things you mentioned which we haven't touched on uh, was like gift aid and possible complications, people in England being members of uh, uh, the National Trust for Scotland and examples like that. I mean, is, is the ultimate answer to this really that we should separate gift aid from the actual rate of income tax, and just which has been done in the past, and just say, well, it's 20 per cent and forget about what the actual rate of income tax is or um, I suppose that, that 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 would be one approach uh, I mean I, th I think the, the the gift aid issue is is um, one that that we had already with the Scottish rate of income tax isn't it there, there are bound to be difficulties um, in the past, so income rate tax rate has changed when it was reduced and they didn't reduce the gift aid at the same time they at least delayed it. I think I think, I think you so could be right. Yes, charities. I think uh -huh. that's right. That to to sort of protect charities from yes. a reduction in income. Um, the, 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 there is also the the confusion factor of people making contributions to different charities and and, and so on and so forth. So that that might be if if, if we're going to have uh, differing rates between. Um, Scotland and the rest of the UK having a separate gift aid rate might be a possibility that would simplify things. Okay, um, thanks. Um, well, the ICAS paper, there was a lot of uh, things I was interested in, um, but certainly the, the fundamental principles, uh, your kind of section three. Um, and, and one of the things you raised, and you've raised it a number of times, is, is the kind of whole time scale of all of this. Um, and you talk about uh, there's widespread expectation the devolution of further powers will be delivered quickly, but expectations need to be managed and the time allowed to make sure that it is done in a sensible, planned manner. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Because, I mean, clearly, I mean, a lot of us would think it's good to spend a lot of time thinking about things, and we did that with SDLT and LBTT and all of that area, and yet there's been a time commitment in here. So, I mean... Do you, do you feel the time commitment should maybe be put aside and, and we should just take as long as we need to go through these things? It seems to me that if you don't take the appropriate amount of time, the chances of coming to a bad outcome are much greater. And by bad outcome, I mean something that is inconsistent or not sustainable for, for, for the longer term. And it has been um, a very common concern raised that... If you think of the time we, we, we've taken over the years in, in both parliaments to try and get things right, and still maybe not have got there, that this just seems um, far too rushed to be able to get something that uh, actually makes sense. Um, what is the, the, the saying, marry in haste, repent at leisure, and you're almost kind of divorcing in haste, repent at leisure. So it's really about taking the right amount of time and having the right resources into the process. Uh, and, and it was really a concern that um, we certainly wanted to express that there shouldn't be a, a sense of having to be rushed. And actually having a process and a timescale mapped out might have given more comfort. Because there's a lot I know at the, some of the civil servants we speak to, um, at the UK end in particular, who have to do the transfer out, who are still not clear on how... I suppose the Smith Commission, which is the politicians rather than the governments, sorry, the political parties rather than the governments reaching a consensus um, to move forward, is actually going to feed through. And I think the process between the parliaments, a time scale, joint committee workings, etc., all that is still not widely understood. And it would be helpful to have that mapped out, time, likely timetables and processes to manage expectations as to delivery um, of, the, of the new powers. I mean, I mean, clearly things can be either done quickly or more slowly. I mean, we, we did uh, LBTT over months, and I think mm -hmm. all of you had mm -hmm. input, and that was much appreciated. Whereas at Westminster, they just said, midnight tonight, we'll change the whole SDLT system. I mean, is, is one right and one wrong, or is one better and one worse? I think the, 
Well, because they can, I suppose. Um, it's not the first time taxpayers have been changed overnight. Um, and it's something that a number of people raise eyebrows at. But equally, if you gave people three months' notice it was going to change, or six months, you then get into the behavioural responses. And I know that's been concerns before about how far ahead is the right time to announce for example, the LBTT rates. I know there are difficulties in making those revenue neutral, but there was also the behavioural response Im impact on that. And then uh, the, less, the less said about political stunts, the better, probably. Um, okay, I, I mean, Mr Garden, the, on that point, can you, do you have views on whether well, these things should be done suddenly or gradually? Um, I mean, I think I, I, ideally gradually, and I think the, the, the example of LBTT was the opportunity to start with a clean sheet of paper and create good new tax law for everyone uh, across, across the board. Um, and to, to a large extent, that was uh, achieved, and we were grateful for the level of, of engagement and consultation in, in that process. Okay, there were maybe a couple of areas which were almost in the too difficult box, uh, uh, and I think that that's an example of one specific tax uh, where e e even then, and the time frame we talked about, there was there was still not enough time, I think, to address all of the issues. So I, th I think the the importance looking forward for further Scottish taxes is trying to take the opportunity to create good new tax law that ties in with the uh, the, the the points uh, that that we highlighted at the beginning of our paper with the Adam Smith principles and, and, and everything else, so that. Uh, they, they can actually do what, what they're meant to do. There is certainty for the taxpayer and they collect the revenue in an efficient way for, for the authorities. Hold on, Mark. Yeah, you sorry. wanted to make a point here, sorry. Just <coughs> around the issue around behavioural response, and I, I take the point that's being raised. Obviously, the, the uh, LBTT rates were announced in advance, and um, I was just wondering, that may not be the area in which you have the relevant information or expertise, but have you noticed any indication of a behavioural response given the advance warning compared to obviously the, the, the lack of any advance warning of the, the stamp duty changes south of the border? I think the behavioural response um, uh, that I, well, I have heard, but it's purely anecdotally, about the, the usual, if you think you're going to pay more tax by waiting, you don't, you don't wait. Um, but that would be pure anecdote rather than, than anything I can offer any evidence of on the, 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 the moves in the market. Okay. Um, but you only have to read the newspapers to know what they see. Uh, I think the do. surveying firms are, are definitely saying that there's an increase in market activity in the sort of bands where uh, LBTT will be more than SDLT. So it is, it is, I mean, quite how much of that is just sales chat one doesn't know, but I'm sure that, that there do appear to be more transactions going through. Sure. To pursue the kind of the whole timescale thing, um, I mean, there's obviously there was the plan under the present Scotland Act to have a little bit of control of 10p on Scottish rate of income tax. We're now talking about control over both bans and rates. So. How do we do that? Do we, I mean, I think ICAS were kind of suggesting step by step, and possibly even if there was further powers, that should be further down the line. And yet, is it better just to bring it all in as a one-er? And, you know, so should we bring in the rates and the bans and the Scotland Act, put all that all together and bring it in in 2016, if that's possible? I, I think this is where you have to take almost each of the recommendations and each of the taxes separately to work out what is the, the, the right path to get as quickly as you, know, you, you no doubt wish, something that's sensible. My understanding from HMRC and the team looking at how they will deliver what's in the Scotland Act 2012 at the moment is that it is relatively straightforward for them to move from the lockstep proposals to rates and bans so that they could uh, implement from 2016 so almost layer over the administrative proposals, the fact that it's rates and bans rather than the, the rates in, in a lockstep. Now, it would seem to me that if they've been geared up for the 20, 2012 stuff and feel they are ready to deliver um, and go through the process, the process for them isn't much different. So why would you not let them go ahead when they were ready and, and, and have that as, as the timetable? I don't think it can be brought forward. I would wonder why you would delay it further. 
um, if they were ready to do it, they might as well do the one exercise, do it for what is now intended to be the outcome, rather than move into 2012 with a lockstep and then, then move forward. I think there's two aspects, of course, which is making sure the administrative arrangements are in place to deliver what Parliament wishes. The second is what's Parliament going to do with the powers in terms of adjusting. Um, I think our feeling was it will be enough of an exercise. It will take probably a year or two anyway until HMRC really has the right Scottish taxpayers coming through the system properly. There will be a transition and a familiarity for taxpayers. So sometimes the fewer the big changes you, you inflict on a taxpayer population uh, at a time, it, the better, but there's probably no right, no right answer to that one. But if, if they're ready to deliver, why would you not have them deliver? What HMRC are going to do in the meantime is you play around with the codes... Uh, rather yeah. than having a separate system with different mm -hmm. uh, ba rates or bans. Well, I mean, I just wondered if we, if we did something quite dramatic, like going 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 on income tax, that would be very different from what's happening down south. Could they cope with that? Um, my understanding is that they feel they can because you've got the code identifier of the self-assessment system but because the proposals do not adjust anything before, before taxable income, and then it's the arithmetic applied to it in, in rates and bans, that they feel that payroll systems can cope and that their system can cope with doing the right calculation. So the identifier of the Scottish taxpayer sends your taxable income number into the Scottish calculations <coughs> Or, and if it doesn't have that, it goes into the rest of the UK calculations. So my understanding is they think that arithmetic box, uh, the, that, that part of their IT systems can actually cope with the rates and bans as well. I, th I think right, that's that. certainly our understanding of it as well, yeah. that, it, that it's, it's, not, it's not actually terribly difficult to, to have different, different rates and bans. I suppose what is different is that with the Scottish rate of income tax, it was probably not going to be a terribly great change for many taxpayers, whereas this might be. So the taxpayer education process and also the significance of whether somebody is or isn't a Scottish taxpayer and whether they, you know, when people become one or stop being one and all those sorts of administrative things, that's probably going to be more of an issue, depending on what rates are set. But you could imagine that would be more of an issue. So... The needs, we need to be sure that enough resources are being put into this by HMRC. And even though it's not a devolved tax, maybe there is going to be some of a role for Revenue Scotland in actually assisting with you know, disseminating information about it because revenue, people are going to start thinking, well, you know, I have a, a problem about my income tax. I'll phone Revenue Scotland. It, it might be a natural um, reaction for them for, for them to take. So I, th I think it, because it's rates and bans and not just the 10% thing, um, it's more of a change for taxpayers and employers for that matter. Um, so it may be that more needs to be put into making it, making it work. But the actual payroll system doesn't, doesn't seem to be too much of a challenge. I think the, the, the educational side of it, I think, is important because I think even sitting here today, the number of people out there who have no idea that there is already that provision in the 2012 Act for the Scottish Rate of Income Tax. But, but the, the other point which is going to have to be addressed anyway and is in the 2012 Act is back to this identification of Scottish taxpayers. And Elspeth said, if, if HMRC are ready, and the latest thing I saw was their risk register in October, which I think had changed their... Uh, point about identifying Scottish taxpayers from an amber to a red. Now, I don't know whether that's just because the timescale is becoming shorter or because they are actually identifying that it is not as easy as one might have thought in all cases to be able to identify who a Scottish taxpayer is. But as, as, as I say, that's something that's going to have to be grappled with anyway because it is to come in in 16 for the, uh, the Scottish rate. OK, thank you. And uh, my final uh, point was under, you've got a section on the uh, constitutional issues, scrutiny, etc. And 4.4, you talk about um, you know, the fact there's a majority uh, party in Parliament. And you, you question, you talk about the ensuring that there's a satisfactory quality of legislation. I just wondered if you felt that, you know, since 2011, 
there had not been a sufficient quali quality of uh, legislation, obviously, especially for this committee, for example, SDLT, uh, land landfill tax, which are the, the legislation that we've dealt with. It wasn't so much a concern about what had happened, although I think there have been times at which I've, I, I've been a, a little surprised at what has happened in, in, in Parliament. Um, in, in terms of the votes going through without, without scrutiny, in terms of without lots of questions being asked in Parliament, and I don't think any of the tax powers had a lot of questions in the parliamentary chamber. Um, a concern that there have been issues in LBTT that the more difficult and the too difficult pile that, that still haven't really been finalised at, uh, at, at this stage. Um, but it's difficult stuff to get right, and that is not intended as a criticism of the, of the, of the committee or, or anyone. But if we were to have a lot more to consider um, of a lot greater significance, the question would be, is there sufficient, would there be sufficient time to do it properly? Uh, and, and part of that should be, if you're looking at accountability and scrutiny, concerns raised by members that all of a sudden this huge workload would be landed... Um, it's not as if any MSP has been sitting doing nothing for the past number of years since the Parliament was established. A lot more work. How's it going to get done? Uh, and how's it to be done properly? And it goes with the concerns we had about pace to consider things properly. So it was, it was getting to the concerns around the pace and the possible rush and, and wanting to get the best possible outcome and to have time to, get to, the, to deal with the opportunity as best you would wish. I've noticed there's less time to sit around here than there is at Westminster. But <laughs> uh, do either of the other two have comments on that kind of point? No. I think it's, it's just um, a recognition that, that there are a lot of things to, to, to think about, or there will be a lot of things to think about, um, because even with the income tax, although it's Westminster legislation, I mean, there's, there's, there's quite a lot of issues that this committee probably needs to be keeping an eye on. And the costs, apart from anything else, of uh, implementing these uh, rates and bans and so on. Thanks so much. I was just wondering if uh, the Deputy Convener was one of the 1,260 ICAS members who participated in the survey. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, I didn't actually, because I take the view that uh, I'm here to listen to surveys and not to take part in them. And just on, incidentally, on the point of your survey, I noticed that 61% of uh, people who did respond said that uh, the speed of delivery of devolved powers to meet voters' expectations were either very important or fairly uh, important. Um, uh, Jean, to be followed by Malcolm. Okay, thank you. Um, a couple of points have already been dealt with, but w one of the things that comes through, and, uh, I think, is the, the kind of anxiety or... Um, certainly emphasis on on cooperation between the company and, and not having dramatic differences in tax levels on anything I think or certainly on the on, on those that are being proposed um, when we were taking evidence for example on the on the landfill tax there was a suggestion of of uh, landfill tourism and crossing borders and so on. How, how much is that really a consideration? I mean, if, if we look in, I think there is reference actually to the south of England and, and France, for example, on, the, on different VAT levels and, and what that does to a, to a market, um, Northern Ireland, Southern Ireland, and so on. How seriously can you, can you take that, given that there are, in some European countries, very dramatic differences in VAT levels on, on different uh, uh, services and so on. Um, yeah, well, um, just anyone really? I, I, I think there is evidence um, in a number of uh, research papers about what is just it goes back to the behavioural response to if I can get it, my booze cheaper by getting a ferry to France, I, I, I will do it. Um, not that I've ever done it, but you know that that, that that kind of scenario. It is the premise. I haven't, honest, honest, honest. I fly, I fly, uh, I fly places. I don't try. Um, the but you know it's the whole. 
do people do it? Well, there wouldn't be a call to cut corporation tax if there wasn't expected to be a behavioural response from, from doing that. Um, the question as to the extent and how much the tax difference has to be to have that behaviour, uh, I think there's probably less direct evidence on. Um, so if, for example, income tax rates move from 20 to 21%, would you get a lot of movement across the border or, or would companies locate differently? I suspect not. It would have to be something um, more meaningful and, and, and more sustained uh, to, to, to achieve that. Um, so I believe there is evidence out there, but, but not so much in the degree. I think tax rates, if, 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 if you look, I think you're right, it, it depend, depends on the variable. And I think there are examples where certain tipping points, excuse that phrase after your landfill tax example, but um, there, there, are, there are various tipping points, I think, which, which can be reached. So it, it, people and businesses will take a lot of things into account. And one, one of them that they will put in the mix, I think, will be tax. And, 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 and I think you're, you're right. There, there are always going to be differentials. There are always going to be different ways of doing things. So it's not automatically a given that as soon as there is any differential, that will lead to a massive flood of people going one way or, or, or the other. But I think th there will come a point where, uh, where there will be greater evidence of, of people looking to behaviourally to take to, to take that into account. Okay, thank you. And, and kind of on the same theme, I know that in, in your uh, uh, submission to the Smith Commission um, on economic growth and job creation, um, power could be devolved to allow the setting of a minimum wage for Scotland. And just in the same vein as that, I mean, that has not, as it happens, it's not part of the, of the political party's pre uh, uh, recommendation, but I, I think I'm right in saying that it, for a large majority of the 18,000 odd, and including your own submission, it was something that was recognised as could happen. I mean, what about behavioural change in that instance? And, and why would you, I mean, why would you be recommending it? And why do you think it would, it hasn't ended up being a recommendation? Um, I think in, in terms of behavioural change, I, unless you were to cut it dramatically um, and almost become a slave economy, I doubt if it would have much impact and I really doubt if that's going to be in anyone's uh, sen sensible proposals. Um, it comes into what's the, the ultimate um, cost for business. Uh, as Isabel said, uh, wage costs and cost of living in the southeast of England are very different from the more rural parts of Scotland, and it might have been that some flexibility was sought. Why it didn't go through, I think, if, if I interpreted the, the Smith intent properly, there was a wish to maintain a single UK jobs market or labour market, um, and that's why national insurance didn't change, and that's why employment law and, and minimum wage is part of that, that, that hasn't changed. Um, with competition across borders, there is always the concern about the race to the bottom uh, as, as being not, not great, but this was regarded as being an identifiable part of something where there could be made a distinct economic case for, say, rural Scotland cost, cost of living and, and, and south of England. Um, it wasn't the single biggest thing that members said, but it was an observation a number of them made. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Malcolm, to follow by Gavin. Um, the, the Chartered Institute, like others before them, goes back to the principles of uh, Adam Smith at the start of your uh, paper. Uh, do you think there are um, any discernible underpinning principles in the contemporary Smith? Um, I'd, I'd I think, I think um, in, in, in all of this, we, we very strongly feel that these, these principles still apply. And I think in looking at each of the individual taxes, I mean, I think subject to some of the EU laws and everything, pretty much everything could, in theory, uh, be devolved. But I think you need, you need to come back to these principles and say, well, what, what are you trying to achieve? What are the cost-benefit an, uh, analysis? What impact does it actually have on the... Uh, the, the, the taxpayer, what is the efficiency of, of collection to, to get, get the result. Um, so uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming uh, that, that in the, the Smith Commission uh, they, they were try, trying to 
factor some of those uh, those elements in and deciding what uh, at this point was was right to uh, right to do be bearing in mind those principles the others would be i mean are there any principles that you would like to see there that aren't there I, I, I think that's quite a difficult one to um, expand on because there's so much can be interpreted into the, the, the Adam Smith principles, you know, what is convenient and what is efficient to collect, uh, for example. Um, I think the one we might put in would be about uh, a coherence for as long as we have two parliaments uh, <coughs> setting tax uh, powers in different ways, or, or, or we will be there, we'd like to see a coherence in terms of the taxpayer experience or the business experience, that they weren't going, they weren't overlapping, they weren't too contradictory, um, and they had as few interactions as, as, as possible um, in terms of the parliaments and the complexity, because that brings complexity. I, th I think for our part, it would be the fair play sort of principle that was mentioned earlier that, you know, not to have a repetition of the ATED type situation um, would, would, would be a good principle, um, which to some extent is mentioned in the Smith report, but I, I, I do think it needs to be strengthened. That's helpful, thank you. I mean, I think one of the most interesting issues that's come up today is round, round VAT. I'm sure a lot of us will go and do some more work on that but i mean I, I mean does anybody know the answer to the question of which would be you know under current circumstances would the consumption approach or the production approach be more beneficial for scotland does anybody know the answer to that question or is that unknown i would imagine it would it would be the um the supply basis that would be more beneficial or we'd have to all start eating a lot more biscuits <laughs> I suppose, um, I mean, I, I don't know the answer, but if consumption depends on, I suppose, the income position, then you get a different income profile at the very small number at the very high end in the south of England. So if all the London bankers are eating lots of biscuits, you know, you, you would get the same caviar. answer on that. Or caviar. It's <laughs> probably zero caviar. rated, isn't it? I don't know. <laughs> I'm just, I, I, I don't um. know. It's... It, it, it's, it's a good question as to what is the right method, and I, I don't think perhaps some of the economists would have a better answer. Just a, a, a that. I mean, maybe my logic's wrong, but I mean, VAT is, is cumulative on every service that, that it's happening. It's like value added, literally, on, on everything. So presumably, the, the top rate of tax is, is the, the final sale. So it diminishes underneath that. Would that not make it? No, because you get an output with an input, and every out, out, sorry, everyone who's making an output takes off their their input. So it is on the yes, um, but cumulative value added. Yes, if but that, everybody if that's who's VAT registered is paying more. They're, never, they're really collecting. They're really claiming back more VAT than they're charging because they presumably yes. are value added. Therefore, it's cumulative in that yes. sense. Yes. Although some supplies are zero rated, so you mm. know it's not a it's not a simple sort of area. The only people affect anyway. Uh, some previous witnesses have said it doesn't really increase accountability. Um, the, uh, assigning VAT. I mean, do you have a view on that, or do you see certain advantages in assigning VAT, notwithstanding the difficulties you've described? <coughs> I I I must admit the. I think it is easier to see accountability when there is a particular voter's experience of something, and I'm not sure that these few will feel the same experience of an allocation of consumption or production based, based VAT. But that would purely be a perception problem, and it's, it, it's not something we've necessarily studied in detail. It's it's rather remote, isn't it? Um, an, an allocation of VAT revenues without any control over um, the the policy or anything like that. So I don't see that it does. I mean, if it was the case that there was only VAT on alcohol and you know, somehow you could influence how much VAT there was, then you could you could see that it increased accountability, but not when it's the whole of VAT. It's just far too remote. I mean, I suppose 
quite like to just in the sense that it, it could be related to the state of the economy, but obviously you've um, there's different ways of looking at that, as you've highlighted this morning in terms of production and consumption. I mean, I mean, I suppose another issue, and this is a more general question, is to what extent the actions of the UK Parliament could have a... I mean, I obviously support um, optimum devolution, whatever that is, but uh, I, I kind of worry about are there some actions of the UK Parliament that could have negative consequences of tax changes that they make? I suppose... One scenario might be if, you, if we don't have any assignment of VAT, what if the UK Parliament suddenly decided to change the balance between income tax and VAT, which uh, has happened to some extent under uh, Conservative governments. Um, or, I mean, another scenario would be if, if the UK government, with, with or without changing VAT, reduced uh, the rate of income tax. Jim and Margaret Cuthbert have written a paper about this, which I won't attempt to summarise, but they're arguing that would have negative consequences for Scotland. So I'm just wondering whether there are any changes that the UK Parliament could make in its tax um, um, policies that could have a negative effect you know, under the Smith proposals on our Parliament. The, the main one under what they're, they're currently proposing uh, would be if they had a vastly widespread change to what was defined as, as taxable income. Um, because, you know, if we look at the income tax piece, is that likely? I would be, I would be very surprised. We're talking about, you know, everyone gets another 10,000 of, of personal allowance. But I think if you have control over rates, I, I think that's probably where, where your exposure would sit. It would be if they vastly increased, let's say they doubled the personal allowance made at 20,000 a year. Um, I don't expect in any way or sense that they would, but that element of variability um, would have to feed through unless your rates and bands powers meant you could almost introduce a lower rate or a band that cut into the personal allowance. And I'm not sure that that's been defined or not, whether you could or not. Because I think at the moment the powers see personal allowances for the UK and then rates and bands as the assumption. Um, you probably have to look at whether you could actually eat into the uh, personal allowance. That be dealt with. I mean, it's the other area I think of great uh, mm -hmm. importance and a certain amount of uncertainty around all this is the block grant adjustment. But, would the scenario that you suggest should should theoretically the block grant adjustment not deal with that because that would change the income tax base in England? Should that should that not result in a in a in a in a, in a better block grant adjustment for us, as it were? Yeah, or, or are there some problems? I suppose that was going to be in my next question anyway. We, we have a block grant <coughs> adjustment methodology for threat. Uh, the Holton methodology does that does that translate um, simply and effectively into the enhanced income tax uh, powers that we have, or in fact, are there lots of complexities that are introduced by having rates bands on the whole of income tax? My understanding is that the block grant adjustment for SRIT has still not finally been worked out, but I could be entirely wrong on that. Um, I think, though. What, this is, what the debate is demonstrating is that there are a lot of possible consequences and adjustments at one end that can, on one parliament that could impact on the financial position of, of, of the other. And that these, the time has to be taken to think through all of these permutations and make sure that the framework for the block grant adjustment to take account of all the powers being devolved under Smith is clear and robust and understood and, and supported on both sides, or otherwise it just becomes an arithmetic um, uh, playing field uh, in terms of what the adjustment should be. And I don't think that's a healthy or constructive way forward for, for, for either parliament. So there's a number of things here we haven't answered, but yeah. we, need to, we need to make sure there's a mechanism to answer them. I think it would be good if all the people who understand taxation thought of all the worst case scenarios, and then we could obviously try and avoid them in the legislation yeah. that goes through. Yeah. I think the, the, uh, another area is national insurance because national insurance is income tax by another name. So, you know, if the UK rates of income tax were dramatically reduced but national insurance was increased so that the UK government got the same take, how would that play out? And again, I suppose that comes down to how the block grant adjustment is made and, it, and the sort of fair play principle and all the rest of it. 
So it's a bit chicken and egg. Well, I think, the, I think your suggestion of a fair play principle is very important. I mean, it's highly subjective, unfortunately, but I think that is important. <laughs> Thanks, Malcolm. I mean, um, the VAT thing is important because, of course, in the 1970s, when Dennis Seely was Chancellor, he set two rates of VAT, 8% basic and 25% for luxury goods. And uh, as I recall, it was deeply unpopular because luxury goods included fridges and cookers and washing machines, etc. Uh, and, of course, when Mrs Thatcher came in, it was, it was changed to 15% across the board. So there has been a history of differential VAT rates in the UK. Mark wanted to come in with a small point on VAT. It, it was just to pick up on that, actually, convener, because obviously the assignment of VAT relates to the first 10 pence, or the first 10%, uh, the 10% the of VAT. Now, at the moment, VAT is at 20%, so it's effectively half of VAT coming to, to uh, VAT raised in Scotland being assigned. Um, the question arises whether there would be the potential, as the Commissioner highlights, of VAT being lowered substantially on a particular sector, and there are a number of sectors who have made calls in the past for VAT to be reduced to, for example, 5% in certain areas to stimulate economic activity. Obviously, that would have a consequential impact on the assigned revenues without necessarily the Scottish Government having an input into the policy decision that lies behind that. Do you see that, I mean, I, I, I realise we're, 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 we're at the risk of creating the Isabel Dinverno fair play clause, but, <laughs> but at the same time, in terms of the principle of fair play and the principle of more intergovernmental working, do you see that being something that, you know, in terms of Malcolm's point about worst case scenario, something that really does need to be ironed out around those potential future decisions and the impacts they could have? With the the likelihood of reducing below about 15%, I think it's subject to a number of pretty strict EU um, conditions. So we're not likely to see a lot of it. The question would be, would those calls be in an area where really Scotland was disadvantaged? So say tourist, tourism beds, hotel beds, I think, as, as Ireland may have, uh, were at 9%, would Scotland actually be disadvantaged or have the same or corresponding economic um, outcomes as, as the rest of the UK from it. So one is the outcomes. The second aspect is, would that be your, your choice of power? I think that goes back to how the agreements are struck between the governments mm -hmm. to decide exactly how to implement the provisions here. I think these are all good questions that need to go into the um, working out what the principles of the, the intergovernmental agreements are going to be uh, and, and what the four are going to be for actually deciding whether that's fair or not. or I mean, they might do something like that and you'd be perfectly happy with it and say, we wish you'd done it years ago. Uh, so they don't necessarily have to be negative. So there's, there's separation out of, is it the financial effects you want to deal with? Is it the process of agreeing what might be mutually useful you want to agree with? And, and all of these have probably different solutions to them. Mm. I mean, the issue, of course, is it's hardly a, you know, a debate between equals, is it? You know, I mean, the Treasury's got the whip hand, and the UK government's got the whip hand, and we've seen that in a block grant adjustment for LBTT already, and that's a real issue uh, of concern. Um, Gavin, to be followed by Michael. Thank you. Um, the, I find the VAT uh, stuff fascinating, and I think, I think we're all very grateful for, for what you brought before us today. Um, in, in the Chartered Institute of Taxation paper, though, you make the point um, that we should look at other jurisdictions, such as Germany, where assignments of revenue are part of the settlement between national and local governments and take account of the issues. Um, I mean, just was that really something for us really to consider, or is there something in Germany or elsewhere that where they've already wrestled with many of the issues that have been raised today and, and instead of completely uh, reinventing the wheel, are there other sort of good models out there we can have a good look at to get a handle on things quickly? I think it was, it was trying to be illustrative. I'm not, not an expert on how, how it does work in Germany, but, but I know that there is a particular way of dealing with it in terms of how, how they, uh, within their federal system, uh, they, they allocate. Um, so I, I think it, it, it was meant to be illustrative, but I, I, I think it is one that is worth uh, is worth considering in terms of the uh, the, the, the impacts that, that, that there may be. Okay, thank you. That's, that's helpful. I mean, anything to add to, to, to that point? I, I mean, I think all we've, we've identified this morning um, is that there are different ways to do a VAT allocation um, and that probably 
I don't think we've got the answer, but we think there's probably more out there um, could helpfully contribute to that uh, and different methodologies to be developed. Okay, thank you. Um, come on to a couple of points from the, from the Law Society paper. Um, the convener, or it might be the deputy convener, asked about the, the gifted issue for income tax. Just to be clear, I mean, are, are there how are the issues arising for gifted um, under the Scottish rate of income tax different to the issues that would arise from the Smith Commission proposals, or are there, are, is it really the same issue magnified slightly? Um, I, I, I think it's probably the same issue magnified s slightly um, because uh, it'll be the whole of the the, the, the rates and bans being uh, being devolved. So I don't I don't think it's particularly a different issue. It's just to a, to a greater extent. Um, you know, the complexity is still there. Okay, thank you. Um, and I was very interested in your, your comments on the uh, ATED, which, which again, something we hadn't really, uh, certainly I hadn't thought about too deeply before. I'm not sure if we had as a committee. Um, if, if I heard you right, though, am I, am I right in saying that in, in strict legal terms, it's, it's a separate tax, but in, in conceptual terms it, it's one they're one and the same is that a fair point well, I think in conceptual terms it's considered to be part of it SDLT if you go to the um, the home page the stamp taxes home page it says SDLT and ATED on it so you know it's the same people who deal with it in HMRC policy <coughs> and so on um, and it was part of the three-pronged attack on envelope dwellings and all the rest of it. I mean, it is a different it it is a different tax. It has different tax returns and so on. But it's just it's not that different really. Um, so that it ought to be dealt with in the same way. I think it's more of a timing issue. That if we'd had ATED at the same time, uh, if we'd had ATED already when uh, the the devolution of SDLT <coughs> was being talked about, I'm pretty sure it would have would have also been devolved. Um, but sometimes you have to be careful of what you wish for because um, if ATED was devolved to the Scottish Parliament, I think we'd want to probably avoid a situation where we were forced to introduce a Scottish ATED because, you know, that the Scottish Government's already decided it doesn't want to have an ATED-type tax, or it appears to have done so. Um, and I think that's that was certainly a bit of an issue with LBTT, wasn't it, that... The, the, the way in which it was devolved in the Scotland Act meant that it had to be a transaction tax. And so there wasn't a great deal of flexibility about how to do it. Um, I believe that in some of the wording in the Smith um, report have tried to say that the Scottish Government should be free to decide how it would introduce any replacement taxes, which I think is a flag for it doesn't, it doesn't want to be a straitjacket like it was for LBTT. Um, so anyway, you know, asking for ATED to be devolved is perhaps not what we want. We just want it to be switched off. For Your Scotland. sort of recommendation is that in April of next year, on the same day as when stamp yeah. duty land tax is switched off in Scotland, ATED should, should be Just not apply off. to yeah. property in Scotland, to, to, to residential uh, property in Scotland, yeah. Okay, thank you. And in terms of the, um, I think it was Elspeth, Elspeth Orchard, and you put some, some numbers on it. They were, they were low numbers, I think you said a million, but is that when the, the tax is set at two million and your view is that as it comes down to, to 500,000, then obviously it becomes more relevant? Yeah, I mean, that was the, just quoting from the revenues, HMRC's estimate of the tax in 2013-14. Uh, um, it will become a lot more relevant. It comes down to 500,000 from 2016. 17. 17. I'm being told 17, not 16. Um, it's, it's, it's coming down in steps. Um, it's, it, as Isabel said, um, it, it, its history is quite interesting. It was introduced as a separate tax to deal with stamp duty land tax avoidance. Um, although it was introduced as a separate tax, and that is the, uh, the, the kind of joined um, but separate at the same time. Um, it's interesting from the HMRC perspective, the UK government, because I think one of the statistics that came out in the autumn statement was it's already generated five times as much revenue for the Chancellor as he thought it might generate, which is a very nice tax if you just decide to introduce it. Um, but all the, you know, as, it's, as it is growing and we're becoming more used to it, um, probably its role in the tax system 
is changing. Um, and perhaps I, I would agree with Isabel, and whilst it's not too embedded, might be the time to um, raise it as an issue just to, to clarify matters and, and clear the whole landscape. I mean, it was, it was introduced to try and stop people putting properties into corporate envelopes. It hasn't done that. People have continued to um, put properties into corporate envelopes, which, which is why the take from ATED has been so much higher than the government expected. But I think they are, they, I mean, they raised the rates of ATED from next year anyway as well. So um, they obviously see it as a good revenue generator, but we just don't think it should be applying to Scotland. OK, thank you. And um, just the last issue I wanted to, to look at was income tax. Um, I think across the panel, you put forward some pretty strong views about why the uh, Smith Commission agreement on income tax should be implemented uh, alongside the uh, Scottish rate of income tax in 2016, and then you put forward some strong reasons why uh, you might want to delay it slightly. I mean, do you do any do you, do your organisations have a sort of um, actual view on, on when? Um, the Smith income tax proposal should be implemented. You've outlined, I think, both sides of the argument quite cogently. Ultimately, though, does your organisation have a view on the, the correct year um, for income tax to be fully devolved, the bans and rates to be devolved? Um, from my perspective, I don't think we have a clear view on an exact year, uh, but I think we tend to fall on the side of uh, let the Scottish rate bed in for some of the points we made earlier about it just being over a, a, a certain amount and get used to some of the, the difficulties we've talked about identifying Scottish taxpayers and the impact for businesses, payroll systems, individual taxpayers having to self-assess a different rate of tax before the further powers are, are brought, brought in. I, I think from the grounds of practicality, I think we would agree. I think we would uh, suggest that the process that is in train at the moment with HMRC aiming for 2016 is allowed to continue uh, so that the whole administrative framework is set up. It may be that when the powers on rates and bans come in, you decide not to move them for the first year just till you make sure the whole system is working. Um, but with all new systems, I think it is useful. I think we think it is useful to give them time to bed down before there are perhaps more significant consequences from whether the administrative piece works or not. Because there's no there's no trialling of this. There is no um, pilot system to be set up. It will be switched on from that tax year. So um, going ahead from that. But if and when you decide to exercise the powers is something you have the opportunity to take more time about um, to make sure that some of the consequences are, are understood in the block grant adjustments and all, all, all that stuff. Um, that could that could come later. I'm not sure we entirely agree. I, th I think we've always thought that the Scottish rate of income tax was a rather odd um, power to, to, to have and could result in a lot of cost for the Scottish government with precious little gain, um, particularly if the Scottish rate was set as quite similar to the UK rate. So I think although the, the time is relatively short, given that it seems to be that the computer systems could cope with it. I think we would favour moving straight to the Smith type um, uh, rates, rates and bans. Um, the, the Scottish rate of income tax is, is, a, is, a, is a, a, a very inflexible and, and uh, strange proposal with, a, with, as I say, a lot of cost attached but not much benefit. Grateful. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Thank you for that. Very cool. Thanks very much, Convener. It's been uh, real interesting listening to some of the, the analysis. Sometimes it's felt a bit like we're in a game of bullseye. Let's have a look at what we could have won. Um, but ICAS, interestingly, in your survey, looked at some, you know, at least asked a question around powers that we already have and them not being used. And, and there was a very strong feeling uh, from your survey that, that there were areas where the, the Scottish uh, Parliament, Scottish Government, had not used the powers that it already has, uh, even looking at, at what we, we might get more of. But interestingly for me, the example that you use uh, was of the council tax. Now, I find that strange, given that if there's one tax that has 
featured very prominently in government policy and the, with the amount of money that's been spent on freezing the council tax, that, that seemed to me to be a very strange example to use of a power not used. I think the, um, the point being made there was not so much from parliament to, to local authority level, but in terms of I as a resident or any of my, my neighbours who pay council tax, what changes have we seen? Um, not a lot. In terms of the method and approach, the valuations, etc., what properties are taxed and what we, that doesn't appear to anyone to have changed more recently. So um, that, I believe, is under the control of more, the local authorities downwards, but dependent on the agreement from the Scottish Government. But it was, it was interesting, if you look at the amount of tax raised through council tax in Scotland, I think it's about the £2 billion a year level. Um, there was felt to be, um, you know, that's almost, it's not quite, but it's at least 80% of what is thought to be raised in corporation tax. Um, that you had something quite significant there under control that hadn't been altered or adjusted in, in, in a way that anyone experienced. And it was being seen through that analysis and that lens that the point was, was, was generally made. Um, moving on from council tax, you get to business rates, and there's been separate discussions um, uh, on that as to what is the, the optimum level of, of business rates, and that is a direct cost on business in the same way as someone considered corporation taxes or employers' national insurances. So it was looking at those. Um, now, I know there's, there's, there's a proposal being announced to, to look at some of those, um, and, and that probably is the, the response that our members would have wanted to see, that something in that area where there is tax being taken out of the, the economy um, that that was an opportunity that didn't seem to have been exploited by the Parliament so far. Yeah, because I also found it interesting, Mr Garden, that, that you had referred to local taxation in, in your paper, and you had reminded us that, that there had been a consultation uh, undertaken by the government following their commitment in their manifesto to replace the council tax. It never uh, came to fruition, but you raise it in the context of the implications of the transfer of funds uh, to follow the, the council tax benefit or the council tax reduction, as it is now. There will now be um, a commission to look at, at the, these uh, taxes. Could you expand on your considerations of what the implications would be in terms of the points that you made in your paper about taking into consideration the transfer of funds? Uh, you know, what sort of things have would that commission have to look at uh, and bear in mind when it's, it's uh, formulating its, uh, you know, its decision on what should replace the council tax? I mean, I think that the general point that we were trying trying to make was in, in looking at uh, more, uh, looking at tax generally, take it to the next level and, and look at the uh, the local taxes. And I think we wanted to make the point that uh, that there may be specific. Uh, requirements in, in specific areas so having that ability to extend that responsibility and accountability was something that should be uh, should be looked looked at here um, I mean we, we were really just I think making the point that as part of the overall review of, of, of taxes uh, we should we shouldn't just stop at a certain level that it's important to go down to that that next level and look at the flow of funds and, and local taxes generally that's fine I think both of you have made very valid points for sure <coughs> Help to clarify the, the points made in your papers. Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, very much, Michael. And uh, just a couple of further points from me. Now we've concluded questions from the committee. And, uh, and Isabel, let's just uh, that this uh, we'll go back to once again to ATED. I mean, uh, um, why would um, I mean? I'm sure that you know one thing about it not being um, uh, utilised by the UK government, but as as you say in your quote, a three pronged attack on the perceived avoidance of stamp duty land tax through enveloping. Surely we would want to have this devolved as opposed to switched off completely, because it would still bring in some revenue for the Scottish Government and it would, of course, uh, uh, eliminate some avoidance. Um, I, I think the, the problem with devolving it rather than switching it off would be that the Scottish Government would then perhaps almost be forced to set up a similar ATED-type system. Most, most people think that it doesn't stop you Putting, uh, putting properties into companies 
it hasn't had that effect. So it, it, it's, its objective was to stop that behaviour. It hasn't stopped that behaviour. That behaviour continues because people um, are often put properties into companies to avoid inheritance tax, and the rates of inheritance tax are higher. Therefore, you know they're quite happy to pay to pay the ATET. So it doesn't achieve the objective. Um, the Scottish government's approach of of having a an LBTT charge on the transfer of shares in companies that own residential property might be more successful in stopping the enveloping of properties. Um, if that if that could be made to work, so I think I think it, the, the, ATED is terribly complicated. Um, it it has uh, an awful lot of administrative paraphernalia um, because it captures every type of company with residential property in it, and you then have to have lots of exemptions for you know people who are letting residential property or developers who are you know house builders or property funds or um, houses which are being used for, for trading purposes like hotels which are actually houses and so on and so forth. So there's a whole lot of, of administrative nausea with it. Um, so you, you wouldn't really want, I think most people would think you wouldn't really want to be forced to have something like that in, in Scotland. I guess it depends to some extent on how it was devolved, whether it was devolved with sufficient flexibility that um, the Scottish Government could do its own thing. But we But we didn't think it would be advisable for it to ask for it to be devolved and then have to do a Scottish ATED because that's a waste of everybody's time and money really uh, for the for the amounts that it would it would actually bring in there are better ways of achieving the objective probably which are well um one, one of them is the um the the charge on transferring shares in companies with with residential property okay uh, now, um, just again, what, what impact um, do you think that the general anti-avoidance rule uh, will have on tax avoidance in relation to devolved taxes, and especially with land uh, buildings transaction tax? And uh, what role do you think um, uh, revenue um, Scotland compliance officer should have in that? Um, the, the Scottish GAR is obviously much fiercer than the UK GAR um, because it doesn't have an independent panel um, for Revenue Scotland to uh, refer matters to first and also because it's uh, aimed at avoidance rather than abuse. So it is, it, it is, it is fiercer. And I would think that that would um, have an effect in stopping um, LBTT avoidance. I think Revenue Scotland, for their part, can play a significant role if they do actually carry out inquiries um, uh, assiduously and do f follow things through because in the early days of, of SDLT there were certainly very few revenue inquiries and most people knew that uh, you know d those those divining d designing tax avoidance schemes could say to their clients there's never been a revenue inquiry into these it'll be fine uh, so we, d we obviously don't want to have that sort of situation when LBTT starts next year so I think I think the um, the landscape is different and the, there's, a, there's a stronger anti-avoidance power um, and uh, one, one hopes that Revenue Scotland will also do a lot more inquiries into returns um, than HMRC perhaps did with, with SDLT. Um, and I think on the enveloping of properties, that could also play a, play a role. Um, because it's one it's one thing to have tax charges that apply to um, properties in corporate envelopes, but it's another thing to make sure everybody pays it. Um, you know, you, you, you need to have the administrative um, inquiry so, um, side of things also working properly. Hey, thank you. Just yes. One general point on that. I mean, the Scottish General Anti Avoidance Rule uh, sits there, and I think it is consistently been said that it is setting the stall out as to what the level of tolerance is as opposed as distinct from any targeted anti-avoidance rules that apply to specific taxes and I think the role of a, a, an anti-avoidance rule like that is, is as much as have having it there hopefully as, as it actually being being relevant in, in numerous cases to actually have to be be actioned so I think that there clearly has been a, a, a 
a key message that has been put out there that, that this, this sets, sets the bar. Um, and I think when you look at some of the specific taxes, you have to look at what actual targeted anti-avoidance the uh, there might be, or on the corporate envelope one, whether transferring shares, for example, might might be a mechanism to prevent people doing doing other things. Thank you. The only thing I would add, I think it's absolutely right. It was it was put there as a deterrent, and I, I think it will be. In terms of Revenue Scotland's role, they do need the information and analysis and understanding of what's happening in the marketplace to be able to apply that rule or put challenges that the GAR should have applied when someone perhaps has thought it, it shouldn't or for some reason it didn't catch a transaction they've been involved with. And I think it remains to be seen how they're actually going to monitor market activity and transactions taking place to weed out the ones that they think are able to be challenged or, or, or not. Uh, and I'm not aware that they're quite settled on what that process is, although we know they have decided there won't be a disclosure of tax avoidance scheme type type provision in place. So apart from the returns going in, seeing, am I falling foul of the GAR tick? Well, nobody's going to do that because they think they won't be falling foul of the GAR. Um, I'm not quite sure that, that for that slice of transactions, they've yet determined their, their investigative and enforcement mechanisms. Okay. I, mean, Although, I, I think one advantage they do have is that they will be working very closely with registers of Scotland. And one of the easiest ways of policing SDLT, which HMRC could have adopted, was just to go from the land registry and look at the transactions that were being registered and follow them through and check that the SDLT had been, had been paid. And there'll be a much closer link between registers of Scotland and, um, uh, and Revenue Scotland than there ever was between you know, the land registry in England and HMRC. Um, and obviously registration in Scotland is more important than it is, it is in England anyway. But I think if, if, if people know that you know, everything that's registered um, on the land register, it is possible that Revenue Scotland will be picking things at random and following them through to the LBTT returns, that that will, that will give a, a, a sort of a more rigorous regime. Thank you uh, very much for that. A lot of um, issues to, to ponder. Just wondering if there's any further comments or witnesses would like to make before we terminate the session. No? Okay, I think we've covered a lot of ground. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I've really appreciated uh, um, your involvement this morning in answering questions and also the questions uh, from the committee. Um, at the start of the meeting, the committee agreed to take the next item in private. I therefore like to uh, close the public part of the meeting for five minutes to in order members to get a, a natural break.